Purple Lays. My name is Tom Goatman and I'm the CEO of BGS. The first webinar held on the 22nd of July focused on delivering livestock performance and environmental improvements. We were joined by Paul Muto from Natural England, dairy farmer Rob Richmond, Professor Chris Reynolds from the University of Reading and Sam Lane from Cotswold Seeds. The discussions in July focused on how to select and grow, animal performance and herbal lays in agri-environment. We hope you're able to join us in July, but if you're unable to, there are links in the re uh, to the recording from the evening on the AHDB and BGS website. Feedback from the first webinar indicated that there was demand to look in more detail at certain aspects of herbal lays within different systems, including establishment and utilisation. Tonight, we'll be focusing on establishment, looking forward to 2021. We have an excellent panel of speakers this evening with first-hand experience and knowledge of getting herbal lays established. The format following introductions from the panel will be a Q&A session where our panel will be happy to take any questions you may have relating to establishment of herbal lays. These may be issues you've personally experienced in getting herbal lays established, or perhaps you are looking to integrate them into your system for the first time in 2021. The webinar tonight will be recorded and the link made available, so there will be the opportunity to watch it again in the coming weeks or perhaps revisit early in 2021 as you are planning to get your own herbal lay established. I will now hand across to Becky Mars from AHDB, who will be facilitating the webinar, webinar to outline how it be managed and outline uh, and introduce our panel. Becky. Thank you, Tom, and good evening, everyone. I'll run through the housekeeping and introduce our speakers and facilitate the Q&A, doing my best to keep us all to time. Uh, for today's webinar, everyone is muted, but we would like you to ask questions using the chat function at the side of your screen throughout the webinar. To find the question box, click on the orange box with an arrow at the top right hand of your screen and you'll see the box. You can see the webcam at the top when you change your view. All questions are private and your identity won't be publicly displayed, therefore you can ask any questions. If we can't answer your question during this evening's webinar, we will get back to you later. If you'd like to record your attendance at this webinar for your Dairy Pro points, please enter into the question box your membership number or full address, including your postcode, your email and date of birth. If you have any technical problems this evening, I'm afraid the standard advice is the simplest, switch it off and log back in again. We'll be using a poll function at two points during this evening's webinar to gauge potential further delivery on this topic, as we know there is a lot of interest. And now I'd like to uh, introduce you to our panel tonight. Uh, we have Kate Still. Kate has been at the Soil Association since 2010, leading farmer advice on livestock health and welfare, and more recently taking on overall management of producer-focused farming programmes. Kate has been leading the work on herbal lays, for the past few years, initially through the Innovative Farmers Programme, where a field lab was, was established to look at the impact of grazing pressure on longevity of species, composition, and additionally, now through the Fabulous Farmers Programme. This programme has enabled a learning network to be established in the southwest, focusing on encouraging the uptake of herbal lays as a way of increasing functional agrobiodiversity on farms. There are also demonstration events and demonstration farms where the impact of in the inclusion of herbal lays on reduction of inputs and value to livestock health and biodiversity can be monitored. Welcome, Kate. We also have Dafford Parry Jones. Dafford and his family farm their uh, nine, what, 190 hectares upland beef and sheep farm near Machanlith in mid Wales. Don't quote me on that pronunciation. Since converting the farm to organic nearly 20 years ago, they have continually developed efficient, low carbon footprint methods of producing quality beef and lamb for their customers. This includes the introduction of multi-species lays back in 2002. Various species and establishment methods have been investigated over the years, mainly through the involvement as a demonstration farm in the Waitrose and Ibers Sustainable Protein Project 2012 to 2016. Achievements been recognised with the BGS UK Grass and Farm of the Year Award uh, 2014, finalist in Farmers Weekly Sheep Farm of the Year and a past winner of the Waitrose Leadership Inspira Inspiration Award, Champion Beef Carcass and Land Producer of the Year. The farm has opened its gates to many visitors over the years and Dafford is the current chairman of the Welsh, Welsh Federation of Grassland Societies. Welcome Dafford. And now to Robert Thornhill. 
Robert had a growing interest of grazing management, prompting a change to spring calving in 2000 after managing 130 pedigree Holsteins on an all year round calving system for 10 years. He's now well on his way and established a milking and milking 280 Frisian Jersey crossbreds. In 2012, he applied for a Nuffield farming scholarship, spurred on by a concern that the pasture-based industry was increasingly moving towards a higher cost and input dependent system. Rob studied forages and grazing techniques for sustainable pasture-based dairying, which exposed him to a host of alternative concepts. This has led to several experiments on farm, including trialing mixed swords as part of his pastures. Welcome, Robert. So as we mentioned earlier on, each of our uh, guest speakers will have deliver short presentations uh, and then we'll have a Q&A. But our first slide should be Chloe. We're going to have a poll, I believe. Here we go. So we'd really like you to tell us what are the main issues for you surrounding establishment of herbal lays? So the question, the options for answers are going to come up shortly, which you can select one of. So are the barriers to you weed control, variety selection, soil type, establishment method or other? And if it's other, please type it in the chat so we understand what those barriers are. So we'll give you a few moments to do that. Okay. In a few moments, we'll get the result. Okay, there we go. So most of it, we're in the right meeting then. So the majority of you are looking at establishment methods as a barrier. So hopefully we'll uh, put your minds at rest by the end of this evening. Uh, weed control and variety selection are uh, close seconds and thirds, and then soil type and other. So we'll look at those other comments uh, later on. Thank you very much for uh, putting your answers in there. That's really useful. So we'll now go to Kate Still from the Soil Association and Kate, uh, Chloe will move the slide over on for Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. Um, so yeah, so I'm Kate. I work for the Soil Association. Um, as Becky said in my um, comprehensive introduction, I've been uh, working <laughs> Um, with Herbolais for the last couple of years, initially uh, with a group of farmers who were establishing a trial. Um, Rob had some some involvement in that in the early days um, through Innovative Farmers, and then following that more recently through this program called Fabulous Farmers, which is a big European program about trying to um, transition farmers more to sort of agroecological practice and adopting these measures which deliver functional agrobiodiversity. And herbal lays is, is one of the measures that we're really trying to encourage farmers to adopt. So we've been doing a number of events and um, training events and demonstration um, events so farmers can gain more knowledge about herbal lays and also these learning networks so that they can really basically share share knowledge amongst each other which is really how this whole process works and, and how uh, we all learn from one another so um, I just really wanted to share a few observations and learnings um, that I've picked up from the farmers that I've been working with and all the researchers and and specialists particularly um, the guys at Cotswold Seeds who I've been working with um, and um, sort of just give a, a bit of a summary to some of the things I picked up around establishment and then I was just going to say a few words about some of the farmers that I've been working with and, and um, some of the uh, ways they've been establishing their herbal lays. So um, the first thing that you know you really want to be thinking about is is the need to plan. You really need to plan how you're going to fit a herbal lay into your rotation, um, what kind of planting window that you have and, and how you're going to fit it into your system, whether that's a, with an arable rotation, whether that's in temporary lays, whether you want to think about trying to stitch in herbal lays into sort of more permanent pasture. You really need to plan because key things is the timing of sowing and also ensuring that you have um, a, a really good seabed prepared and those are the two things really that are success with establishing these lays. Um, sowing time is really critical because you've got legumes and herbs in these mixed um, species lays and they really need 
warm soil, so eight to 10 degrees to, to germinate. And you need really good levels of soil moisture to make sure that you, know, you get that good germination. So often autumn sowing has found to be quite successful. So I know people are putting them in the ground now um, or, or have been, and maybe you've probably got a little bit more of a window potentially equally, you know, if we're gonna get some, some rain coming, uh, it should be good time to start sowing them now or um, in the later spring when the soil's warmed up. So April, May, but a key thing is you need you need warm soil in order for this variable species to germinate. And the next part is really seabed preparation. So um, I certainly found generally a sort of ploughing and then a secondary cultivation and rolling in order to get that really fine seed bed has proven most successful. However, um, listening to some of the researchers who were involved in the Tom's project down in Cornwall, they found that actually um, tillage depth didn't have a, a massive impact on overall dry matter yield with these herbal lays and, and found that they could have equal success with a power harrow to five centimetre depth and uh, disc arrows at 10, 12, uh, 10 to 15 centimetre depth. Um, so it's all going to be a bit dependent on your, you know, obviously on your soil type and the conditions of your soil when you're doing these cultivations. But however deep you, you do it, it's about then establishing this really lovely fine seabed and, and, and the rolling it appears that rolling is the answer. The more you know, the more compact and you can get it, um, the finer you can get it, then the better. So um, broadcast sowing seems to be the most successful way. So you get an even distribution and it appears to reduce weed ingress uh, if you if you broadcast. And it also allows you to, um, to sow as shallow as possible, which really is essential with these really teeny tiny seeds that you get in, in a mix, particularly some of the herb and, and the legume seeds, which are really very small and will get lost. I mean, you can drill and I know people do have success drilling, but you want to go no deeper than a centimetre, otherwise these seeds are going to get lost. And then it's all about soil contact and you need to really focus on rolling then, that appears to be the answer. Once you've sown, before you've sown, you roll, once you've sown, you do more rolling um, in order to ensure that you get this really great seed soil contact and you can lock in moisture and um, yeah, certainly <laughs> seems to be definitely, if you can roll again, then roll again. That seems to be the way to, to really help with your establishment. So depending on your plan and, and how the establishment of your lay works um, within your rotation, I certainly found um, some of the farmers I've been working with, they've had equal success direct sowing as they have um, uh, establishing a lay as a under sowing and uh, say a whole crop. Um, which they're cutting for silage. So both seem to be um, pretty successful. It just depends what you've got, you know, working within your system and, and, the, and the windows that you have. Um, but you really just need to think about what kit you've got and, you know, learn from other farmers. Um, obviously, like you're doing tonight, um, listening to Rob and David, what success they've had and, and particularly, you know, within your locality, within your soil type, listening to um, how other people are establishing them. But it, but soil contact and soil moisture um, are really key to um, making sure that, you know, these seeds are able to germinate. Another thing is um, weed control. Obviously, that came up in the poll, something that people are concerned with because um, the mix of having broadleaf and grass, um, grass species in the mix, you know, means obviously you don't really have any herbicide that you can use um, after you've established your lay. So you're really then looking at your timing. What you need to do is think about the weeds that you've got on your farm. When do they germinate? Think about your weed ecology and then try and obviously sow at the opposite end of that, so the you know the the, the um, whether it's you've got spring germinating weeds, then you want to try it, and so in the autumn, similar with how you try and approach weed control in an arable crop. You just need to think about that. And then lastly, so management post-establishment. So you really need to protect those little seedlings early on while they're establishing their root system and, and getting going. So you need a good six to eight weeks for them to establish before you can think about uh, grazing them lightly. And, and that light grazing can often help with some weed control if you've had some, you know, some weeds coming through as, as the crops established. So uh, some light grazing, but you really obviously want to prevent any kind of poaching um, or anything that's going to create gaps and allow 
more weeds and to, to spread or to obviously to damage any of your little delicate seedlings that have come through. So, so yes, certainly think about the weeds that you've got and how you can sow at the opposite time to when when they are going to be germinating and then think about your management once your crop is established you know obviously don't go in too hard treat it very gently so moving on I just wanted to share a few photos and actually I've got a, a little bit of video but I think it's gonna look a little bit like um, moving stills of some of the farms that I've been working with so this is a, a farm that I've been a dairy farm, uh, organic dairy farm in Wiltshire. He's on Salisbury Plain. And this is a herbal lay that they established back in autumn 2018. It was supposed to sow it in the spring, but we had that, obviously, that incredible drought. Um, and so they didn't, thankfully, didn't even try to get it in. So they had waited till the autumn. It established quite well. Um, he has then um, over sowed um, the following spring with some additional seeds, certainly the bottom half of the field, because he felt it was quite patchy. But since it's, it's done it really, really well, um, um, and he's, you know, very, very pleased with how it's been delivering for the cows. And if you just move on to the next slide, um, that one. Yep. So that was one uh, photo I took because I've been uh, doing a little bit of monitoring of this uh, lay because they've been uh, trying to reduce the grazing pressure on, on some areas to see if we can uh, extend the species diversity over a longer period of time. And if you can see, I don't know, you can't really see in that picture, and I can't point at the picture, which is what I'd like to do, but you've still, the, this photo was taken in July this year, so he just had it grazed, and you can see you've still got a good species distribution. So you've got the chicory in there, and yarrow, and clover and grasses, and then you've got the plantain, all this rib grass. And then also, if you can see um, in the sort of top right corner, there's little uh, crinkle cut leaves, which is the burnet. So within a quadrat, there's, there's you know, really good uh, distribution of species across the whole field, which obviously he's really, really pleased about because, you know, you sow this quite expensive seed and, and you really want to see all those species doing well across your field. And he's had good success with that. I mean, I think obviously benefits from having quite a light soil on Salisbury Plain, which definitely um, seems to um, do what these, some of these uh, mixes seem to do particularly well on, but obviously other people have found them very successful on the heavier soils. So if we just move on to the next picture. Uh, so this one is a farm down in Somerset, another organic dairy farm who I'm working with. And the picture on the left is uh, taken back last September. And this uh, herbal lay was established under a pea barley mix in the spring of 2019. And um, indeed has been doing very, very well and the farmer has been very pleased. Um, it came away really good that you can see there's quite a dominant of um, the chicory um, in that first picture, which was taken, as I say, last September. And um, and certainly when I went out this um, summer, you still got quite a, you know, a dominant of the, the chicory in the field. But the farmer's really pleased with how the cows have been milking on it. It's done incredibly well in the dry conditions earlier in the spring. He is now thinking, because it is a little bit patchy, that he was going to over sow this autumn with some grasses to fill it out a bit. But um, certainly has been delivering very, very well and found it successful establishing it under the pea bar mix and um, felt that that helped suppress the weeds even though possibly um, it reduced perhaps some of the germination of the grasses because you've got that shading so you know it's a balance and obviously he, now he's going to look to over so with some grasses but still you know very very pleased with the way that those those lays have um, been working so if I just move on to the the last picture so lastly, there's a, another farm in Wiltshire um, that I'm working with, another organic dairy farm who uh, runs a sort of New Zealand dairy system, wants to stay milking and is obviously trying to keep his cows out as much as he can. Um, they're only in for just a very minimal time over the worst of the winter. It is quite a wet farm. He has um, problems with 
flooding from the Thames. And so they've now almost put the whole farm over to Herbal Lays has found that this um, rooting that you get within the Herbal Lay has been brilliant at sort of drying up land when they've had problems with flooding or really wet conditions and forming this sort of spongy root system that really protects the soil and allow, you know prevents the, the cows damaging it and then enables him to keep his animals out as long as possible. Um, and then back out again uh, as early as possible. I know he likes to be back out in February. So um, really successful and he's, you know, very, um, very invested in, in the change that he's made. You can see from that picture, he's got quite a dominance of the clover and you've got less, less chicory in that field. That again was established last spring, so spring 2019. And then that picture was taken in the autumn. So, yeah. So I have to say all the farmers that I've been working with, majority of them are dairy farmers, um, have really only got positive things to say about herbal lays. <laughs> and they've been performing, you know, brilliantly. And um, so I have highly recommend. Um, but thank you. That's great. And, and right on cue. Really good timing. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, just while Daffod prepares himself, uh, just one quick question. You talked about the temperature of the soil needing to be warm enough. What is warm enough for germination? So, so yeah, eight eight to ten degrees. I understand is is the temperature for the the um, the clovers for your legumes and herbs. I think the grasses can keep take it a little bit colder, but in yeah. order to make sure those those um, herbs and um, legumes germinate, eight to ten degrees. Okay. That's really useful because you know, normal grassing, as you say, sort of five to six degrees, you'd probably crack on and expect it to germinate. But if you want sure. everything at yeah, yeah. to germinate, may hold off warmer. as well. Brilliant. That's thank right. you. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Daffid. I will hand over to you now. You just, Daffid, can you just unmute yourself? There we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Hi. Yep. The farm is in Machenfeth. It's about 20 miles north of Rabavistlith. Um, these are the farm facts. As you can see, we've been farming organically for nearly 20 years. Growing diverse lays has been an important part of uh, getting an organic system to work on an upland farm. We'll move on. Diverse lays or multi-species lays, as I call them, contains many elements. We've got grasses in there, legumes, and also herbs. Many of them have several different root depths and create nutritionally balanced grazing lays. Plants perform at different temperature and conditions to extend the growing season and help in extreme circumstances. Some provide protein, others help the animal to absorb protein and improve animal health. Others provide minerals from deep down in the soil profile. Others fix nitrogen. Others provide carbohydrates. Others use, use to give um, soil a fertility boost and help to create a healthier soil. Some will last for one year, others up to five years. Others will take the lay on to 10 years. It's a developing lay that will evolve naturally over time. To eliminate the need of, of going back to seed in about three to four years. Main reason is to provide plenty of organic silage feed from limited silage fields. We'll move on. We were part of a project a few years ago looking at, at growing more of, a, of our protein at home and part of this project was the establishment of these multi-species lays. As you can see in this picture, we experimented with these two fields, exactly the same mix, but one seeded under a cover crop in late April and the other seeded in July after a silage cut. After this experiment, we now favour establishing our lays under sowing in late April, early May. What we advise with herbal lays is to make the most of the first two years, as some of the components die out within that time period. So by sowing in early spring, you make the most of the first year and also getting a bumper crop of arable silage, a second and maybe a third cut within that first year before, before the winter kill occurs. 
we move on. We also experimented with the various cover crops. In this picture, we can see the barley sowed um, this end of the field compared to oats sowed in the other half. We also can see betsies in there with a purple flower. In our situation, cutting the cover crop as an arable silage, we prefer the oats as they grow better in a less fertile soil as we have here. We also had a bigger crop from the oats, but maybe in the eating test, the animal preferred the barley as it's more palatable. In recent years, we have introduced forage pea, and that seems to work well. The swords are used in March, April for ewes and lambs. So we'll move on one slide. The swords are used in March and April for ewes and lambs, followed by a cut of silage in late June. This is the quantity cut to fill the large silage pit. But, it, but we can see the red clover there and also the yellow flower of the burst foot sack oil. But it is dominantly a grass silage. And the next slide is in the same location, but a few weeks later in, in August, where the clover comes into its best. This is certainly our quality cut and is dominantly a clover silage. Care should be taken with cutting and handling of this precious swath. We usually put this in a small silos pit, which can be seen in the next slide. As I said, this is the rocket fuel used to feed our ewes before lambing. And with a protein of 20%, ME of, of over 11, D value of over 70, and with a target of over 30%, Dry matter, the sheep absolutely loves it and does very well. Eliminating the need for bought in concentrate. As an organic farmer, our top quality sheep feed could be cost us as, as high as £450, being a huge cost against any enterprise. Therefore, therefore, this pit is worth a fortune to us and help us achieve a more efficient sheep enterprise. The next slide. Um, our lambs fattening in red clover with, with herbs, this works very well with good growth rates achieved and eliminates the need to use any concentrates again. And the last slide is of our cattle fattening in the clover. These cattle are expected to have weight gains of, of between 1.5 and 1.8 kilos a day on these pastures and certainly reduces the need for bought in feed to fatten them. These are strip grazed along the field and moved every two days. I read a Nuffield report on a multi species lace and it says that they are the future of, a, of, a, of agriculture. In my opinion, why do we spend so much on bought-in feeds when we've got the ability to grow of our own protein, high ME, lower fibre feeds of our, of our own on our livestock farms? Our customers will probably eat less, eat less meat, but they demand better, higher quality meat. And meat produced using all the elements of nature certainly demands the respect of our modern consumer. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Daffod. Really interesting. Uh, just while we're handing over to Robert, um, you were talking about being very careful when you're making your clover silages. What techniques do you employ to reduce the leaf shatter? Um, well, we try to cut it on one day. Uh, if it's midsummer, we'll um, wilt it for about one day. If it's late mm -hmm. summer, August onwards, we'll wilt it for two days. We'll try to put the mower and spread it out and leave it to wilt, ideally not in, in a burning sun, but in the heat of the day, in a way. And uh, we will um, gather it together, um, three into one, and mm -hmm. then you need that, uh, that dry matter it could be 50-50, but 50% 50 of it could be dry and but 50% could not, um, is still a bit moist. But you want to be very careful with that leaf and just to move it quietly and, and carefully. Yeah, 
Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Robert, we'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, so first you can just see uh, a bit about Standhill Farm and uh, where we are in the Peak District uh, with a bit of altitude, fairly thin soils, very free draining though over the limestone. Um, I'm always cautious about quoting average precipitation because it depends where it comes. As we all know more often now, uh, it comes in good slogs when you don't need it and you don't get it when you do. Um, next slide, please. So we've heard a lot about establishment already. Kate's already uh, talked about that. And at, uh, for those of you that heard the last webinar, Sam Lane also reiterated the need for a very fine seed bed and rolling. Roll, roll, roll is the key to this. Uh, we've heard about uh, soil moisture contact. Um, so that is also very important to keep rolling. Weed control is one of the big issues that a lot of people face. And I've had some challenges of this as well. So before sowing, one of the options you've got is to burn it off with glyphosate. That's fine if you don't have a seed bank, because then obviously when you cultivate, no different from any other crop, then you can get a serious infestation. And because herbicides are very, uh, well, you cannot use herbicides in a, in a diverse late, you've got to do the best that you can. Obviously, uh, if you're incorporating this with other crops, you've either had a fallow period or you've, uh, you're growing it with uh, as part of a rotation then that can help to clean up the seed bed beforehand. But that is pretty critical because of the limitations you have using herbicides, not able to use them in the crop. We've already heard again about uh, not going in too deep. We use an air seeder. We find uh, we're often uh, trying to get this in in windy weather. So an air seeder does distribute it. You've got different seed sizes as well. So it is quite critical to get an even distribution. The air seeder with an iron box springtime harrow does work quite well indeed. Post emergent management is also a critical uh, part of the equation. You need to leave it till it's well established and then lightly graze it. But again, weed control. If you are unfortunate enough to have weeds, and I'm going to talk about this in a, a short while, you, you've got a bit of a problem because any herbicide is selective. Selective meaning it kills everything except grass. That is not obviously what you need in a herbal lay. Spot spraying is a, a possibility, but you've got to watch out for drift. There's more drift than you think when you're using a knapsack or a spot sprayer on a quad or something like that. And these species in the herbal lay are extremely susceptible to the slightest sniff or vapor of herbicide. So I would, would just warn against uh, with caution against spot spraying, but it, it, is, uh, it is possible. Alternatively, you've got mechanical means uh, like topping or mowing. And then at the very least, if you are fortunate that you don't have many weeds, manual work. Next slide, please. This was a lay that we put in in uh, 21st of August last year. It's a very exposed site. It's uh, about 900 feet. Um, we have 200, uh, sorry, two inches of soil at the top of the field. So very, very thin soil indeed. This one is actually part of uh, one of my trials with the uh, with Natural England and the Peak District National Park on a white peak test that we're doing. Unfortunately, it seemed to be a fantastic year for spear thistle, the worst in our area for 40 years. It was just uh, right, of course, we had established a nice seed bed primarily for herbal lay, but also for the opportunistic spear thistle. So this was after a relatively light grazing, as you can see, and it exposed all the spear thistle. So what we decided to do was try and weed wipe it, but because I hadn't grazed it intensively enough, there were too many herbs at a similar height to the uh, thistles. So we weren't able, or I certainly wasn't confident enough to go in with a weed wiper which you can only use with glyphosate. And uh, I was worried about reducing the diversity using chemicals. So what we did was we flail topped it. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like six weeks later. I was really pleased with the outlook of this and I wasn't sure what we were gonna find. So we then grazed this and the next slide shows what it looked like 
12 hours later. Next slide, please. We've got a good clean out with the greys, and you can still see there are quite a few thistles left, but a much diminished population. So the slide does say six weeks later after topping. Um, this is straight after grazing, but the topping was done after the, uh, the six weeks prior grazing. So quantity estimation. Last webinar, there was discussion of using a plate meter. I don't use a plate meter on the diverse swords because of the calibration. The dry matter is a lot lower. It normally measures somewhere between 9 and 15% dry matter. And the higher it grows, the lower the dry matter because of the proportion of the leaf. So I always do a cut and weigh with a quadrat. With quality estimation, again, in the last webinar, Chris Reynolds mentioned that NIR is not an option, really because it's based on multiple samples and uh, calibration with that, it's, uh, it doesn't fit. Most laboratories won't be able to offer you that accurate service with a diverse lay. Then you're moving towards wet chemistry. Unfortunately, that's very, very expensive. So I haven't actually been able to do any chemical analysis on this, but the most important laboratory that I'm interested in are the cows. The cows will not lie, and they're the ones that you need to observe very closely and they will give you an idea of quantity based on how they leave the residual. And of course, quality, how they graze it. Is it palatable? And again, how far they take that grazing down. Next slide, please. Here you'll see the equipment I use, very high tech. Uh, I don't usually use the thermometer. This was in 2018, and I was just trying to ascertain the difference between covered and uncovered. So pre and post graze uh, with the temperature. You can see what the ambient air temperature is there showing at 24 degrees C. So if you look closely, you'll see a homemade quadrat, which is a quarter square meter made out of reinforcing bar. I just use a sharp knife, a, uh, a single use plastic bag that I use again and again, and uh, which I happen to know is where, that I know weighs five grams. So when I put it on the scale, I know exactly how much the fresh weight yield is. I then take a 100 gram sample out of this and oven dry it. And the resulting, uh, the resulting measurement is obviously the uh, percentage dry matter. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of one of the first herbal lays that I put in. We're a conventional farm, but this is one that I am managing uh, organically just to see how it performs and actually although this one does get plated uh, when we compare against all pallet performance on a plate measurement it's stacking up very well against the ryegrass clover and fertilized swards however as i mentioned already the dry matter is usually a lot lower than a ryegrass sward it's interesting to note though how the progression of species has evolved over this period and although there are more than you can see in this photograph, the predominant one from the original seeding is plantain. And I actually quite like plantain. In the slides I showed beforehand, I omitted chicory from the mix because I find sometimes chicory can be a bit of a challenge to, to manage. I'm not always convinced how much my cows actually enjoy it, although it's, it's a very favorable herb in many ways. So I chose to admit, um, leave it out of the uh, slide that I showed you before. And what we're going to see in the next slide is the reason, one of the reasons why I chose to omit chicory. Now, this was the bottom of field that we hadn't grazed until the 4th of June. And so that tells you what it looks like. These cows, I can assure you, are not pygmy cows. Although they're not the largest, our average live weight is over 500 kilos. So some of this chicory did actually reach seven feet in height. And also it becomes very, very stemmy. It was a lot of fun dealing with this. Uh, I did enjoy seeing what happened to it because we grazed the top of this field normally. But for this reason, I chose to omit it from the last one because the understory underneath this very high chicory was really, really fresh looking and not mature. And one of the things with a herbal lay is you get a, a much more elastic opportunity for, for hitting the optimum energy in, in a grazing situation. 
unlike ryegrass where once you go past three leaves the, the quality starts to diminish uh, this is say much more elastic you can push it right out up to 40 days and so i decided in the last trial to take the chicory out just for more flexibility thank you very much that's great thank you robert if i can invite kate and uh, daffy to rejoin us our uh, audience have not disappointed us and we've had lots of questions come in so i'll go straight to them Just bear with me. So, um, first question: Managing the first few months, especially when sowing a mix with dominant species, how have you uh, managed that situation? Should we come to Robert first, and then maybe to Daffid? Okay. So, as we've already said, the first grazing wants to be a fairly light one, just to take care of those plants. How do we actually manage it after, after that? If you're happy that it's well established and you're not challenged mm -hmm. too much by weed control then it depends what you're wanting to achieve you could drop it into a normal rotation which is often in the early of the 20 days but as i say because of the flexibility you can push that out and still get really really good performance they do perform very very well in dry periods one of the trials i did uh, i made a mistake of putting it in at the beginning of 2018 it was the trial that kate referred to i would never do spring reed season normally on our farm because we can be quite catchy I put that one in and it, uh, in the next six weeks, we only had 17 millimetres of rain. I thought it was never going to come up. When it did come up, everything bar the grass came up. So we had a phenomenal mix of everything except no grass. In fact, it was the, it was the greenest field in the area, the only green field. So um, in, in dry periods, it can be really useful. But that's uh, once you've got it up and running, you're quite flexible in how you can manage them. Brilliant. Daffod, have you got any further comments or observations on that? Well, as I said, we undersow it under oats and uh, arable silage. So the arable silage comes off in the beginning of July. Uh, we get a second cut and that comes off in August. So it's ready to graze in, in the beginning of September. So usually we put a, um, quite a lot of lambs in, in there just for a short period and to move them on. Um, I don't want to graze them for a long time. It's just in and out. And if if I don't use lambs, I use a cattle. And uh, as I said, I use them behind a, uh, an electric fence, so rotational grazing. With the multi-species lays, there's a few things more palatable than the others. So if you keep them in too long, they will pick out the good things and, and you could lose them out of your lay in, in, in time. So you've got to be very careful. You, you've got to manage the field and not the animal, maybe. The field is, is a dominant thing. Excellent, thank you. Uh, right, we'll go on to the next question now. Um, what about dr direct drilling into grass, burnt off with Roundup? Uh, Kate, have you had any of your farmers try that technique? I haven't, no, I mean, predominantly because I work with organic farmers, but I know certainly um, talking uh, to, and I think Sam mentioned it in, in the webinar before, I think people have been having success, haven't they, being stitching into sort of permanent ground and which they've burnt off. I think it's still about having to provide a lot of disturbance in order to, to still get that sort of fine bed established so I think you still even if you've burnt off you're still going to have to really try and work the ground in order to get that seabed prepared but yeah I'm yeah. afraid I, I don't have any direct experience. That's fine thank you. Um, what yield were you seeing from the chicory based lay and did you include grass in the mix if so what which species? So I think that comes to Robert. Uh, so what yields was I saying? That from the chicory based lay. From the chicory based lay. Um, yeah. We were seeing, uh, you were seeing the total of about uh, 11 and a half tonnes based on the dry matter samples that I was taking, say not, not from the plate meter. So okay. um, I say, and, and it does depend when you when you take that the more you grow the lower the dry matter uh, sorry the lower the, the dry matter percentage but obviously the dry matter goes up yeah and, and were grasses in, sorry sorry were, were grasses included in that mix your grasses were included in that mix yes okay and do you know which varieties 
of growth. I, so I've used several. I can't just remember which ones were in that quote, but we've tried ryegrass. We have had some Timothy and a bit of Coxfoot in there, but I tend to go for the ryegrass for, for the benefits it gives us, certainly as the other species diminish. Right, uh, we've got a, a dock based question now. If you sow a herbal lay with chicory and docks come through, how can you control the docks? Because um, if you spray the docks, you'll kill the chicory. Do you want me to state yeah. that one as well? Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, please and then hopefully, hopefully Daffod will have something to add. Yeah. Uh, yeah, docks are really the most difficult, as you know. Um, they're, they're particularly difficult because they, they're great at contributing to a seed bank. And as we know, if you chop a dock up, it just becomes little docks. So they are a challenge. So care, carefully select your site to make sure that you either haven't got a seed bank or you've made an attempt to reduce the seed bank beforehand. And the, the only real way, I think, it is uh, either spot spraying and uh, manually dealing with them. The, the problem, as you know, with docks is they don't tend to grow high enough for most weed wiping applications but yeah. that i haven't had enough experience of weed wiping to comment on that one okay daffy do you have anything to add on that one on the docks yes i've got docks on the farm um and in my silos fields but they are not a problem really as an organic farmer we tend not to encourage docks in the establishment method we tried not to um move and cut the soil too too much because as um Robert said they will multiply so if you're trying to um, plow and think and just to keep them the same level will be okay um, with the docks we tend to if there's a dock problem in the field we tend to put sheep there in March and April and we could grace them out yeah. okay another question for you Daffid um, how much chicory or how many kilos per acre of chicory are you using? Um, this particular questioner has found that if even if we cut back to 0.2 kilos per acre, chicory is still very dominant in the first 18 months. They're in a lowland farm in the southwest. Yeah, um, I don't add too much because, as I said, it, it's a multi-species lays and the legumes is the important part for me, the red clover and, and the white clover. So the chicory um, at two, 200 grams, maybe another 200 grams of something else like plantain. So my herb um, per acre would be about half a kilo per acre total. Right. OK, and I'm going to pick on you again. And another question for you. Uh, what's your annual rainfall and which species are more persistent on your farm? Uh, we are at about uh, 150 centimetres per mm -hmm. year, 60 inch. Um, well, the white clover is persistent and the red clover, mm -hmm. that's what we aim to keep in the sword. And, um, yeah that's the most really okay uh back to robert now have you considered weed wiping post grazing yes as i mentioned before we, we have considered it uh, the the key is to get the height differential between your target weed and uh, what you're hoping to preserve so uh we haven't managed to successfully do that yet because i didn't get the grazing quite right on that one but i think that is if you're not an organic farm, obviously, I think that could be a, re a very real opportunity, depending on the weed, but how you manage it. Yes, I would say that yeah. uh, will be a good idea. OK, and I know you're managing that land organically, but are you using any artificial nitrogen? No, no. OK, that's a good quick answer. Thank you. We can move on. Um, what seed rate would you sow the arable and the under sown lay in an organic system? <laughs> Uh, we cut down the amount of oats and, and, and barley there. We go for about 40 kilos per acre, 100 mm -hmm. kilo a um, hectare. So it's something that we need the bulk, but we don't want to cover those seeds and, uh, underneath. And um, and we tend to go in as an arable silage just to okay. get the um, crop off before it um, shelters the light away from the seeds. Yeah, okay. And Kate, do you have any experience or anecdote, anecdotal evidence of seed rates? No, I'm afraid I don't particularly, no, no. I, um, certainly um, the, the Tom's project found that if they increased the seed rate massively, um, they didn't get 
vast amounts of increase in dry matter so it felt like that you didn't need to have a particularly you know if you didn't put on vast amounts of seeds you were going to then get huge you know increase in, in dry matter produced then i think you can you can definitely hold back on seed rate no no not not look not enough return on investment on that one um Absolutely. right <laughs> a question about risk of frosts on late autumn sown legume mixes has anybody had any disasters or experience no, I haven't. Um, but when you're going into the winter, you want to glaze it off every month. You, want, you don't want August glass going into November. You want to glaze it off and for the October glass going into November and then to leave it over the winter. So you tend to glaze it continually just to get that blade of um, glass to be more in line with the winter conditions. Okay, great. Um, what pH should the soil be at for a herbal lay that has clover in it as well as plantain, yarrow, etc.? Who would like to take that one? We aim for about six um, plus. We aim for the, between 6.2 and 6.5 if you can, and we try to maintain them at that. The lime is very important for the white clover because uh, white clover needs lime and it needs phosphate. So we rather maintain it at, at plus six or to lose our white clovers. Okay, brilliant. Very precise answer. Thank you for that. Should you use a ring roller or a flat roller when you're rolling? Robert, I'll come to you for that one. Yeah, uh, we've tried both. The slide that the slides that I showed you with the, the weeds in on that bank, that was actually done with a ring roller. I think with hindsight, I would have probably gone again. I felt it made a very good job. It, uh, the ring rollers are very good for uneven ground. But as we said earlier, you can't roll it enough, really. You've just got to watch out for capping. And that obviously is dependent on soil type. OK, thank you. Can herbal lays be introduced successfully in permanent pastures on 25 year or more standing? So you've got a 25 year permanent pasture. Can you introduce herbal lays? I've actually done this as an experiment uh, about okay. six weeks ago. I under so um, I, I oversold a uh, field which was actually about 25 years old with a um, seed drill and I had, a, uh, I had a contractor in to do it. And I've been on my knees in that field um, several times looking at the seeds coming out. So I haven't got the answer, but maybe I, I will have the answer next year, maybe. Fantastic. We're going to come back to you on that one. <laughs> Great question. Um, what is Robert's milk from forage on the herbal lays? The, uh, I, because I'm only growing a small amount, it's quite difficult to ascertain the, the production from it. Uh, so I've only been growing them for about seven years. Um, somebody like Rob Richmond has been growing them for an awful lot longer and has a much greater area. So to reliably gain the milk yield off the herbal lace is very difficult. What I can say is that we, we certainly don't see a drop in production and sometimes we see, uh, see an increase. So because of the, I say, the relatively small area, it's hard at the moment to give certainly an annual figure off that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, question yeah, for you, Kate. Oh, sorry, oh, go on. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to agree. Certainly, the, some of the um, other farmers that I've been working with, who um, equally, you know, have some area of herbal lays, they say the same thing that they don't, they don't see a drop. You know, that they're mm -hmm. able to maintain production in the same way. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to. You. I've got a question for you now. Anyway, uh, have any of your clients had problems with wireworm in the establishment of herbal lays, and what advice can you offer to deal with it? Oh, um, no, I can't say they have. No, I've not heard of any of them uh, complaining about wireworm. Um, um, no, and I'm, I'm afraid like it's... It's been very unlucky there. Yeah, yeah. Very. <laughs> um, right. Um, any broad advice on species for long-term versus short-term swords? Well, I'll come to each of you on that. Daffy, should we come to you first? Uh, the long term is the white clover. You can keep the white clover in there for, I've got to feel about 60 years old and it's still in, in, in there. 
uh, for the long term. The short term is the red clover. Uh, it's I, I got a field that I sold in 2015, and lucky it's still it's still there. It's one of the new Abel varieties. And for mm -hmm. the very short term, you've got the vetches and the plantain and and the chicory. So yeah, we've got all sorts of um, length of a period there. So it's a good choice. Rob, any any further comment on that? I was going to say when I started out, I, I did an off the shelf proprietary mix. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say whose it is or not, but we can probably guess. And uh, just really to see what came up and, and what endured on my farm under my management. So that's how I started out and I'm probably going to start fine tuning. I have also had one or two bespoke mixes made up mainly with vetches in and, and uh, as well as the red and white clover. As David said, white clover is obviously the, the most durable, but you've seen the, the picture of my seven year lay. There's still uh, one or two other things and certainly the most predominant other species there is the, is the plantain. OK, that's great. Uh, and while you're there, Rob, um, can you compare your organically managed lays with the others in terms of cow grazing days per hectare per season? Or any other measurement? I've got all the information, but not, not on my fingertip. But every time I put a, a herbal lay in, I do man, manage it without nitrogen because obviously that would discourage the legume growth. So mm -hmm. I say, although we are a conventional system and we fertilize our ryegrass, white clover swords, uh, only frequently and not very high nitrogen, uh, we don't put it on when we're um, putting the diverse lays in for, for that reason. So they, so you might say it's an unfair comparison against the fertilised swords, but they still do stack up very well on their production. Okay. Um, on uh, on sowing dates, what is the last safe moment for getting herbal lays established in the autumn? Apparently, Sam Ray Lane recommends the 11th of September, but has anyone had success after that? And also, can he confirm that the under sown with cereal works for autumn sown? He's only ever done it with spring crops. Yeah, we on the dates I wouldn't go in before the twentieth of April, and mm -hmm. on the later um, I wouldn't go in after the tenth of August. In our situation here, with an upland yeah. farm, and uh, mm -hmm. these seeds we do after the tenth of August, they are so slow. There's so much money going into the seeds, and you don't get anything in the first year. So I, I rather go to the other end and to put them in in the spring. Yeah. Okay. Robert, any? Uh, well, I would agree partially, uh, well, mainly with that. The, uh, we've talked about, uh, Kay mentioned the soil temperature for these things, but obviously legumes need a higher temperature, soil temperature than grasses do. So you do need to be earlier than you would be normally sowing grass only lays on your farm. And I would yeah. say middle of August, possibly if you, if you can, but I would, again, it, it is season dependent, but you don't always know what that's going to be like when you're putting it in. Exactly, exactly. Um, another question, so Robert. There's certainly farmers have been putting them in, in the last couple of weeks still successfully because I think it's been because it's been so warm, like you say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, some springs, I say, I, I wouldn't normally put things in in the spring, and some springs we would be fine. But the, uh, when I put the one in in 2018, it was yeah. well. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so even even, even the, the photographs I showed you, that it was a, a very exposed site, and that went in last year. And then we had, uh, we had what do we have? I'm just looking here. Uh, yeah, we have five, after I put it in, we had 569 millimetres from, from sowing to the end of the year. That's, that's uh, over half what we would expect as annual rainfall just from after putting that in to Christmas. And then, then it got a good kicking from uh, April to May when we only had 59 millimetres and very, very hot weather. And it was, it was really, really burning up, going crunchy. So, um, you know, sometimes that's farming, isn't it? You just have to make the best of it. But so just be aware that legumes do want the higher temperatures. OK, um, another question. Where a farm has herbal lays as only a proportion of the grazing platform, is there any problem swapping between sward types? I, does it have any effect on room and microflora or indeed grazing behaviour? So, Robert, you're ideally placed for this one. Yeah, uh, obviously, with ruminants, you should always make transition slowly. If you have, as the, the question has stated, only a small area, then you're, that's not going to be possible. It depends if you've got no clover at all in your other swords, that could possibly be a challenge. If you do have clover, then of course that puts a baseline of, of commonality in there as well. And if you've got grass in your mixed sword, then that should be better. 
when we grazed the one that I photographed, it was very, very high in clover and I did have concerns, but because of all the other herbs in there, there is quite a bit of fiber as well. Something to watch out for, I would say if, you, if you're just starting out with it, bloat is probably gonna be one of your big issues. So just keep an eye on it. We haven't had any problems with that, but just something to be aware of. Okay, now you've raised the topic of bloat. Um, maybe I'll come to Daffod for that first, actually. How do you avoid bloat on your clover lays? If I graze a, um, a clover lay, I usually graze it with an older feel as well. If I do a paddock, I, I actually take the paddock back, back to the gate. It's like a fan from the gate. So yeah. you introduce the um, cattle or lambs to the older field first. They will fill their bellies in the older field and they will find the gate to the clover lays in their own time. I'm trying also to cut off the water in the, in the clover uh, fields and, and for them to walk back to the old field to get the water. By walking, they will be burping and uh, I hope the gas will be going away. We don't have a problem, but we stick to our our quite definite uh, definite management procedures, and we avoid it then. Yeah, and if it ain't broke, you ain't going to fix it. <laughs> Kate, have you uh, any anecdotes or observations on that? No, I mean I think that's it's all about. Um when you let them in as well isn't it in terms of you, you let them in in the afternoon rather than early in the day when it's you know the moisture's high and um, obviously letting them in steadily so ensuring that they've got you know a high fiber field to um to mix in with it um so timing i think is everything but um but certainly you know some of the other um research projects that have been going mm -hmm. on they've they've not had challenges as long as you're very conscious and careful about that just in terms of the um the mixing uh uh when you've got herbal lays and then you've also got other um sort of ryegrass clover mixes so generally again um the i think um as robert mentioned as long as you've got this mix of already clover in your other fields um then generally there doesn't appear to be huge amounts of problems moving from from one to another and um and the cows seem to sort of comfortably shift from one to another as long as you've got a relatively good fiber content and it's all going to be about when the cows go in so obviously something that the the guys at Cotswold Caesar are very conscious of is making sure that you let the you let it have a good recovery period so that you've got a good established sward to go back to can i just add to that um by putting herbs in the the herbs will keep the animals healthier there's a lot of tannin in, in these herbs and they will help to avoid the uh, bloat problem. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you all. We've got so many questions, but we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to go to our second poll now, if Chloe could pop that up for us. So now, having heard, um, some of you have been to two webinars now, how confident are you to establish a herbal lay on your farm? So the options will come up now. So you can select, you've already sown it, you're going to sow it in the spring next year. You're going to sow in the autumn next year. I've not decided or never. If you'd like to place your bets, please. <laughs> See how the confidence is uh, <laughs> in our audience. I'll give you a few moments. So we have our results. So half of you already sown them. Fantastic. That's great news. 22% um, we're going to sow in the spring. 20% still undecided. Oh, we haven't convinced them. Uh, but that's a good result. Thank you very much, everybody, for taking part in that. Um, we are going to have two more webinars. Uh, there'll be one on the 1st of December on the environmental and financial considerations of herbal lays. And then on the 2nd of March next year, we'll have a, a further one on the feeding and grazing, uh, because that came out very high in our original poll from the first webinar. So we'll be covering those topics then. Thank you very much to our speakers. That's been really enlightening. And I'm going to hand over to Tom from British Grassland Society to wrap up this evening's webinar. Okay, uh, thank you, Becky.
Um, and thank you to um, everyone who's been involved tonight, um, and particularly the speakers, Robert, Kate and um, Daffid. It's been really informative um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a huge amount of information um, that, that you guys have got across this evening. Um, so just to summarise some of the points that um, each, of you, uh, each of you made. Um, so Kate, um, you emphasised the need for a plan and how important that is. Um, timing and seed bed um, is critical to success and the importance of soil temperature as well, 8 to 10 degrees C. Um, and good soil moisture levels to, to achieve a good, uh, um, a good establishment. Um, Daffid, you highlighted the, um, the different qualities of, of the individual species and how you're making use of them on, on your farm. So whether that, that's for the protein, minerals, nitrogen fixing, um, carbohydrates, uh, and also soil fertility. Um, you found establishing under, uh, by under sowing in late April, May um, has worked well for you. Um, and um, it's important to make the most of the first year um, and it's also important to um, have a quality, but as quality as well. So quality cuts and how that's um, um, helped you in terms of uh, managing feed costs. Um, Robert, again, you emphasised the use of um, uh, the importance of seed bed and, and, and roll, roll, roll was your, uh, was your message there. Um, and you also highlighted, you know, weed control is very challenging um, in, in herbal lays. Um, but you, uh, methods such as uh, flail topping have worked well for you. Um, and you also highlighted that um, uh, methods such as weed wiping, if you can, um, if you can achieve the correct heights, um, that, that, that's worked well. Um, and you also highlighted um, the importance of understanding the difference uh, in terms of the quality of the crops and the, the low and dry matter, 9 to 15%, and how you need to take that account, into account when you're, um, um, when you're feeding. Um, and one last point was um, you mentioned the, um, the elastic opportunity you've got in terms of quality. Um, so you've got a wider window to hit that and so that to um, our optimum energy level. So um, that was that was uh, some of the points I took away from your presentations. Um, as we, as we said earlier, that the the presentations are recorded, so um, you guys can come back and and, and rewatch them at your at your leisure. Um, I'd also like to thank um, AHTB, particularly Becky, Chloe, and Sierra working behind the scenes to to run tonight's uh, webinar, um, and that's it's been a great success. Um, Finally, just a quick update on the uh, BGS research conference on herbal lays. So um, we are still planning to um, run the event in the spring, um, but the form has, has yet to be decided. It's a very si fluid situation in terms of, um, of COVID, but um, my, my hope is that we'll be able to run that in the spring in, in, in some form. Um, so lastly, I'd just like to thank you all for, for joining tonight um, and, and, and wish you a, a good rest of the evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.